Uh, good morning, 10 a.m. You guys feeling good on Time Change Sunday? Got an extra hour of sleep. You look good. Grateful to have you. Like Ridge and Lauren said, welcome. If you're a first-time guest with us, my name's Nate. It's an honor, a privilege to serve as the lead pastor. Uh, and if you are new, this is honestly a really great weekend to be here. You're going to find out really quick the heart of this house and what I'm just calling uh, Kingdom Builders one-year refresh, and that's going to mean something in a few moments here. But before we get into that, I, I want to make you aware of an event that we're hosting here tomorrow night. Uh, tomorrow evening, we're going to invite you. We're going to come together, all four services, anybody who'd like to come, for a night of worship. As we all know, this Tuesday, we have uh, the privilege to vote in a very important election. Uh, this will be my seventh election cycle that I get the privilege to vote in. And, you know, I don't, I don't know if it's because I'm getting older. I'm, like, really sentimental, you know, um, the Hallmark Christmas movies make me cry. What's going on? I don't know. But like every time I step in the voting box, I'm just overwhelmed with emotion. Like I can't help but think about um, literally the countless men and women who are fighting for our freedom all around the world to preserve our American democracy, to give us a voice and a right, come on, that not every person has on the planet. That we are a part of a nation that has a republic, which means that the government works to serve the people, not the people serving and working for the government. And that is a privilege that I know we often take for granted, but that's not everybody's reality. I'm also overwhelmed with the countless lives that have been lost in battle to preserve our American democracy. And so voting is not really just um, a privilege, I would say it's a responsibility. You know, uh, Phoenix, Arizona University came out with this study that revealed, this is very shocking to me. Uh, that roughly 50 million evangelical Christians are planning to not vote in this election. 50 million evangelical Christians. For perspective, the 2020 election was decided by less than 400,000 votes. So I think it's not just an honor, but it really is a responsibility for us, especially as followers of Jesus, to exercise that vote. So yeah, we are, what we're going to do is before we cast our vote on Tuesday, and some of you have already early voted, but before we cast our vote on Tuesday, we're gonna come together Monday night, and we're gonna cast our allegiance, our cares onto God. We're gonna cast our future, our hope, onto the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, because as a follower of Jesus, your allegiance, may I remind you, does not belong to an elephant or a donkey, but to a risen Savior, the Lamb, the Lion of Judah. That's where our allegiance belongs. And so yes, elections matter, they just don't matter most. Uh, because no matter what happens on Tuesday, God will still be in control. So we thought, man, what better way to usher in uh, the election than to come together as a body and just worship. Let's make this earth sound a little bit like heaven. Uh, let's be good news gospel light people. So tomorrow night, 6.30 p.m. is when it begins. We'll be done right around 7.30, 7.45. Um, we have child care for birth up to eight years old. So what's that, second-ish grade? Uh, if you have a third grader or older, we would love for them to be a part of that family experience as we pray, we sing, we worship, we take communion together. That's uh, going to be it's going to be a great night. Well, let me pray, and we'll jump in today. Let's do that. Father, we love you. We thank you. Lord, I thank you that there's really no other place where you can find a bunch of diverse people who are going to vote different on Tuesday, who believe different things, who come from different walks and backgrounds and ethnic groups, yet here we are under your roof worshiping this one true God. God, I thank you for the beauty of your family, the body of Christ. And so, Lord, we know Tuesday is a very important day in the life of our nation, uh, but we're going to come together to put our focus on what matters most, your kingdom. And God, we're praying for your kingdom to touch earth. Uh, we love you. We thank you. It's in your name. Amen. Amen. Well, if you could ask God one question, what would you ask him? I know, that's a loaded thought at 1025 on a time change Sunday. But if you could ask God one question, what would you ask him? Now, maybe for you, you would ask him a why question, something going on in your life. Lord, why did you allow this to happen? Or why didn't you fill in the blank, heal my loved one, bring my son or daughter back home to me? Lord, why is this happening? Maybe for you, the, the question wouldn't be why based, it would be how. You're going through something right now in your life and you're just um, navigating uncertainty and you don't know what decision to make. And so if you could have one question, you'd say, God, how do I know if this is the right decision to make? Christians would say, Lord, how do I know if this is your will for my life? God, I don't know how to be a father even though I'm about to be a dad because I didn't have a great example of that. I don't know how to love my wife the way that you want me to love my wife because I grew up in a broken home. God, how should I do this? Well, what's interesting about that question, although 
all of us would have different answers. The 12 disciples, these, these 12 hand-selected men, and of course we know women as well, who followed Jesus, were able to ask Jesus a question. And the question that they asked him um, might throw you off a little bit. It wasn't what I thought that they would ask. Yet the power of this question, the answer to it, led to a massive chain reaction. Now, a chain reaction is simply a series of events so related to each other that each one initiates the next. I love that concept. We, we, we would call it a chain of events. I think if you were to look down the timeline of your life, you would see that your life is not random, it's not coincidence, but really there's a direct link to decisions that we've made and things that have happened to us that have caused a chain reaction. It's no different for our church. We are here today at LifePoint Church in 2024 because of the answer to the question the disciples asked Jesus. So what is this question? Luke chapter 11 verse 1, Luke records it like this. It says, one day Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, here it is, Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm not as spiritual as these guys because that's not what I'm asking God in the flesh. Like, I'm asking, teach me to walk on water. Come on. Like, give me a good party trick. Can we multiply the fish and the loaves? I'm that yeah, you know, like I, I want to teach me to interpret the scriptures the way that you do. But what they want to know with their question, Lord, how do we pray like you? Because when you pray, things change. Well, I love Jesus' answer. Look at the next verse, verse 2. He says this. You want to pray like me? Pray this. When you pray, say, Father, hallowed, which is to say, glory, honor, be your name, your kingdom come. Now, Matthew, another disciple who would have been standing in that same circle, writes to a more of a Jewish audience in his gospel book of Matthew. It's why Matthew had, gives us so much more details. It's very rich in Jewish history. Matthew records that same moment like this in Matthew chapter 6, verse 10. He says, Jesus said, your kingdom come, your will be done, notice this, on earth as it is in heaven. So Jesus is like, you want to pray like me? <laughs> You want to pray big, bold, audacious prayers? Then start praying for heaven to touch earth. Or a better way of saying it, pray for here as in heaven. And that prayer, the answer to that, when we start praying for here to look like heaven, a massive chain reaction started. And it all started in Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28, after Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection... Right before Jesus ascends into heaven, he gives the disciples what we call the Great Commission. It is still the mission of the church today. What is it? Go into the world, baptize people in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey all of my commands. That's discipleship. And they took that commandment on that mountain and that Great Commission, and on, and on Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit falls on the disciples, and Peter stands up, and a chain reaction started. He preaches his first sermon post-resurrection, and on that day in Acts chapter 2, 3,000 people are saved and baptized, and the early churches we know would be started. By Acts chapter 4, 5,000 people have been baptized and saved, and the church is growing like crazy. By Acts chapter 7, a man by the name of Stephen, a volunteer in the church, stands up and preaches a bold sermon, but he did not get um, gratitude for his sermon. He got stoned to death. And Stephen became the very first Christian martyr. But the church did not die. The church would only grow more. In Acts chapter 8, we have an Ethiopian who would actually give his life to Christ. He was one of the first non-Jewish converts. So he would be called what the Bible calls a Gentile. One of the first people who wasn't a Jew, a Gentile, gives his life to the Lord, takes the message of the gospel back to Ethiopia. In Acts chapter 9, the chain reaction continued when a man, a Pharisee by the name of Saul, who made it his life mission to stop the movement of Jesus. And he did this by executing Christians, ripping families apart, imprisoning uh, individuals. Saul is on his way to do just that. And he meets the living God on the road to Damascus and radically gives his life to the Lord and is immediately baptized. And God changes his name from Saul to Paul. We would know him as the Apostle Paul who would write about a third of our New Testament. Paul would make it his life mission to plant churches all around the Western world, specifically Rome. And then in A.D. 44, right around Acts chapter 12, King Herod Agrippa would give the order for James, the brother of Jesus, to be executed. James, the first pastor of the Jerusalem church, 
his life would end. At the same time, the, execu- the, the order was for Peter to be arrested. By 64 AD, Emperor Nero in Rome ordered the execution of the Apostle Paul by being beheaded. But the gospel did not stop. In 80 AD, reports that the gospel had reached France. By 100 AD, the message of the gospel had reached Algeria. By 150 AD, the first missionaries were reported in Portugal. By 174 AD, the gospel had reached Australia, Switzerland, Belgium. By 328 AD, the message of the gospel hit the continent of Africa, specifically in Ethiopia all because of the credit to the Ethiopian in Acts chapter 8 who gave his life to the Lord. Then roughly 200 years after 328 A.D. and 595 A.D., uh, Pope Gregory I would send Augusta of Canterbury and a team of missionaries to this new discovered land called England, where in one year it's reported that 10,000 people would give their life to Jesus and be baptized in England, and revival was sweeping all across the nation. By 635 AD, the message of the gospel had reached China. By 1200 AD, the Bible had been translated in over 22 different languages. And then in the 1500s, a Span- Spaniard pope, Pope Gregory, Pope Alexander VI, would send a group of priests and another team of missionaries with Christopher Columbus on his second voyage to this new discovered land called America. And out of that, in, in the 1700s, would come what is known as the Great Revival. Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield would stir revival in those American colonies, and people in America were giving their lives to Christ. And out of that movement, a guy by the name of Barton Stone would be the leader of a, um, of a movement called the Restoration Movement. It was a belief that church denominations should not work opposed of each other, but should work in unity with one another, that we should lay down our denominations and come back to the Great Commission. And out of that, the non-denominational Christian church movement began. And this movement swept over this new land of America in the 1800s. America experienced what's called the Second Great Awakening as tens of thousands of people are now giving their life to the Lord and the Bible is becoming the source and the bedrock of truth in American fabric. Fast forward, out of that restoration Christian church movement, a church planting organization would start. This organization was called Stadia Church Planting. And their mission was to start new churches all across America and eventually around the world. The mission of Stadia is very simple. Every child deserves to have a church. And little did Stadia know that another Restoration Christian Church in Ohio in 2003 would send two missionaries, Matt and Sarah McGew, to this fast-growing city in the southeast called Charlotte, North Carolina. And Matt and Sarah came to this city with the heart to plant a gospel-centered church, and the chain reaction continued to build. But at the time that LifePoint was getting ready to start, there was another church called Westview Christian Church on the west side of Charlotte. West side was closing their doors. But their leadership made a legacy move, and they decided in the sale of their property and their facilities that they would donate a portion and a lot of their church gear to help start this new church called LifePoint. So that on September 2004, LifePoint Church held its very first service at Southwest Middle School in the Steel Creek part of Charlotte, and God was just beginning to do a new work. By 2010, LifePoint got its first uh, footprint in Fort Mill when we met just two and a half miles down the road at the old Charlotte Hornets training facility, and we met there, and God was preparing LifePoint for its biggest faith initiative to date. When roughly 2006, just under 200 families came together to give to the future. And those 200 families gave over and above their regular giving to a a capital campaign called Step In. A Step In was a dream that maybe one day LifePoint could have its own permanent location and its own facilities that were not dictated by renting or another owner. And those families did just that. That dream, on January of 2018, we cut the ribbon and had our very first services right here on this campus, and God did what only God can do. The chain reaction continued. Since then, in seven years, we've seen 4,362 first-time guests. And that's just people who fill out a card. Y'all know how some of you are. You've been here for nine years, and you haven't filled out a first-time guest card. We've seen 981 salvations. We have baptized 672 people. 
We've given over half a million dollars away to missions. We have grown by 220% as a church from 700 to 2,500 on the weekend where right now we're seeing 650 kids and students meeting every single weekend. And then last November, we came together and we did something crazy. We, we, we believed in faith. And on November of 2023, roughly 386 families committed to give once again, sacrificial, radical giving over and above their regular giving for two years to a campaign called Kingdom Builders that would allow us to build phase three. And just think, all of this is because of the answer to that prayer. You want to pray like me? How about you start praying for here to look like heaven? And look at the chain reaction that has caused. Now, why do I tell you all this for this moment? It's because the history of the church is now in our hands. The history of the church now belongs to you and I in this generation. And do you want to know what the most important link is in this chain? The next one. What are we going to do with the history of the church in our hands? Well, it came on the other end of some consulting that we received that led us to the decision to build onto this building. You probably saw it today when you looped around the building, what we call our phase three expansion. It's the final build on this property. Before we did this, we as a leadership team uh, brought in a group called Unstuck. They're a consulting group that is nationally known. They work with thousands of churches every single year. And Unstuck has determined in their years of doing ministry that there are six stages to the life cycle of a church. Now, I find this interesting. I'll show you the six stages right here. That a church will go from the launch phase, then you see some of that maintenance growth, and then you see strategic growth, sustained health, but then on the other end of the curve, we can slip into maintenance mode, uh, preservation, and then simply life support. And every church, whether they want to admit it or not, are in one of these six phases. The question for churches to really self-identify is where, where are we at? Now, um, they also concluded that the average age of a church that goes from maintenance to preservation eventually to life support is roughly only 60 years old in America. So the average age in America of a church that closes is 60. Now, we could have a cup of coffee and maybe go back and forth on why that is. I, I think um, 60, if you think about it, represents a generation. So what often happens is what reached one generation doesn't reach the next generation, but the church folk aren't willing to give up their methods, and they end up forsaking the mission because of the method, and we start saying things like, well, that's how we've always done it. That's a curse word around here, by the way. That's how the music's always been. That's the kind of programs that we've always had, and what happens is we do that at the expense of the next generation. Please hear me. There is nothing sacred about a method. We have got to stay committed to the mission of Jesus Christ to reach every man, woman, and child with the gospel of Jesus. That's, that's our mission. Yeah, look, I tell people all the time at LifePoint, if you hang out with us, I want you to marry the method. I'm sorry, marry the mission, date the method. Marry the mission, but let's date the method. The mission of people helping people discover full life in Jesus, that's not going to change. That's, that's who we are. That's what we're about. That's the Great Commission. But the methodology, how we practically do ministry, oh, that's going to change. Look, the moment the method is not reaching the next generation is the moment we're going to change and do something different. We will never forsake the mission of the gospel, but we will definitely change the method. And so 2020 hit, and out of COVID, 2021, 2022, we just experienced like revival type stuff around here. There was like this hunger for the word of God and a thirst for the, for the Lord on the other side of this global pandemic. I had never seen in 19 years that I've been here. And we're baptizing people like crazy and real transformation and addicts are being set free and marriages are being restored and teenagers are being empowered and there was just this sweet spirit. And we go from phase one to phase two, from two services to three services to now we do four services on the weekend. And at the end of that four-month um, evaluation and consulting from the Unstuck group, I'm excited to tell you, I thought this was great, that your church, we're right here. We're in the sustained health, which is a great spot. That's really where you want to be. However, if we take our eye off of the link, it is really easy to slip into maintenance, make it all about us, then preservation, and eventually you're on life support. So on the other side of that, 
That's why we decided and felt like, man, now is the time with the, with the church history in our hand. Let's continue to be people, men and women of faith and build phase three. And, and so many of you weren't here uh, a year ago. You know, you're new to the church when we decided to do this and all the progress. You might be wondering, like, what's going on? Uh, so I want to update you on where we're at and, and some opportunities that are in front of us. But before I do that, you know, Gary Heideck uh, on our staff is one of our executive pastors. Gary's been with me for like 12, 13 years. Um, he's an amazing man of God. And, and in his pre-Christian life is what I like to say, uh, he worked uh, full-time construction. And so he's been over all of our projects and has just done a phenomenal job. So to get to know our executive pastor, Gary, a little bit, I want you to watch his story about his life. Check it out. Hi, my name is Gary Heideck, executive pastor of operations here at LifePoint. Been on staff for almost 14 years. My background in ministry started with my mother taking me to church and praying for me, but then really coming full circle when I came to know Jesus in a very personal way when I was 36 years old. I worked for a pretty good sized commercial contractor, eventually got my own license and then started building for myself. By age 36, I had acquired in life what culture and the world had told me were all the good things. I want to be careful here though to be sure that no one is hearing me say that there's anything wrong with some of those things, but I made it about the money, the things, comfort, all about those things. They were my goal in life. Now that, I don't care who you are, is not a good thing at all. I started questioning what life was really all about when my father passed away and my first son was born. Since I had been raised in a church, I decided that I was going to look for answers in the Bible and started visiting local churches. I eventually found a really great church and had a very radical transformation. I mean, all in, thank you, God. From there, I went all in with volunteering at that church for all the behind the scenes things that needed to go on for any growing organization. This was a really great fit for me since being a general contractor is all about budget, scheduling, processes, systems, staffing, all those behind the scenes things which I really enjoy. Soon I was asked if I wanted to come on staff and then shortly after that I was asked if I wanted to go through the ordination process to become a pastor. The rest as we say is history. I love it and call it a great adventure because if you're doing what God designed and shaped you for it is the great adventure. All right, would you guys help me welcome our executive pastor. <laughs> Gary Heideck to the stage, great guy, glad to have you here. So um, I always say the proof of the pudding and Gary's wisdom and expertise in this area of construction, uh, he's overseen both of our construction projects and both have come in on time and under budget. Come on, that's like, you don't hear that. So and it, no pressure. Yeah, no pressure at all, right? Yeah, we he expect He says it. that every service. I said, would you just not put that part in there? We, we expect a hat trick is what I'm trying yeah, to yeah, say. Okay. So um, grateful to have you, Gary. Uh, grateful yeah. that you get to be a part of this church in this capacity. Here, here's where I thought we could start. Um, you know, seven, eight years ago, we started phase one here, bought the land, built the building. Um, how did we get to where we are today? Maybe yeah. just give us a quick synopsis. Yeah, great story or great question. Before I do that, I always want to make the the effort to make sure I say that, and I appreciate, everybody does, appreciate people saying nice things about you, but man, it ain't me. If it was me, we'd be in a mess. It, it, we have a great team here at LifePoint. I mean, a great team, and that includes all of you guys too, mm -hmm. but I mean, we've had the same architects, same engineers, uh, most of the same subcontractors, so um, hats off to those guys. It's just a great team to keep us on schedule and yep. keep us in budget. So, yep. Yeah. yeah, so when we thought about this project seven years ago, we kind of had three phases. Um, mm -hmm. share, share a little bit about that. Yeah, um, yeah. So we thought that what we thought, we knew that we were, some of you guys remember this, we were in the old Bobcats Arena, which was a huge building, but it wasn't really uh, best fit for our needs. It had a huge main room. It had two NBA, full-size NBA courts in it. But um, the children's space and other spaces just weren't were good. And, and our rent was coming to an end there. We needed to move on. We were growing fast. So at that time, we started thinking through the whole process of, well, what is it we really need? Where do we want to go? What kind of a church do we want to be? What size do we think we want to grow to at one campus? So put all that together um, through a, a quite a long process, and we came up with the, the, what we have now, which is uh, we knew we needed about 12 acres of land for all the parking, for all the, the spaces, and the size building. So we decided to move forward on that, and with the um, 12 acres um, and the parking, and all the kids' spaces, so we put all that in on paper, and um, we knew that we needed to take small bite-sized chunks. We couldn't just jump out there and build all of it at once. 
Um, so we thought maybe over 10, 12, maybe 15 years, we would do three phases. <laughs> well, here it is, six, seven years later, and we're already building phase three. So yeah. um, that's kind of how we got to where we're at now. That's great. Yeah. Well, well, I know this final project, this is a, it's a massive project. Mm-hmm. I know when you were telling me some of the things that go into this final build, I didn't realize the volume of what it was. So oh, yeah. let's start there. Why don't you share some fun facts with us? Because nobody cares about the boring stuff, okay? Really? Yeah, give us like... Hmm. Well, maybe there's a few people here that yeah. care about that. But give us some numbers. Like, what uh, are we building? Yeah. So I don't think these are boring. Tell me what you guys think. So all the asphalt, the paving, the stone all together is 2,711 tons. Yeah. That's exciting, Yeah, see, no right? one cares. Nobody cares. <laughs> that one person in the back with the solo uh, clap. Like, well, they, they work in construction. Yeah, yeah. No, so I, I knew that, right? So I, I like that number. Yeah, make, but, give it, yeah, give us a visual. So here's a visual. All right. Um, don't check my math on this. <laughs> This is a tough conversion, but if you were to take that number and divide it, it would take roughly 36,145 teenagers that weigh 150 pounds to weigh 2,711 times. There we How's go. How's that sound? I that like better? that. That's good. That's visual? good. I see that. I can yeah. see that. I don't know how high you have to stack them or how wide they would be, but yeah, 33,000 teenagers that weigh yeah, 150 yeah, yeah. pounds. Okay. Um, okay. And then the concrete, there's 634 cubic yards. Which again, that's that's really. That's really cool, right? It's a lot. It's so cool, Gary. That's so cool, man. So, converted it. (laughs) So, if, you know, a cubic yard is a measurement of volume, so I didn't do the conversion on how high or how wide, but if it was a big cube or a big rectangle, that would be 86,000, roughly, 86,850 regulation size soccer balls stacked together. Wow. How's that? Is that better? Does that convert a little bit? That's better. Yeah, give us one more. It doesn't sound like maybe too much. I thought that would be good. Um, and then um, t- let's go to the how much water it would take. We have the toilets, the urinals, all the new sinks, all the new drains. If we, um, there's like 58 new drains, sinks, and toilets in this new, just the new phase alone. Wow. Um, it's a lot of bathrooms. A lot of bathrooms. If you were to flush those all together, you'd be talking about 50.8 gallons a minute. Now, how would you like to have that water bill? Wow. That's a lot of urine cakes. That's a lot of stuff, yeah. <laughs> It's okay. a lot of stuff. That's great. <laughs> so it's a big project. Yeah. It's a massive project. I love it. Thanks for those visuals. Um, well, let's do this. Let's get inside the project. Let's talk about the value adds. Again, some of you, this is uh, old information, but it's always good to be reminded for those of us that maybe are hearing it for the first time. This is pretty cool stuff. Yeah. What are we getting out of this final phase? We want to start outside? Yeah, let's do that. All right. thought we would start outside, take a shot here of the new entrance, the new south entry. Um, a lot of you guys have seen some of these before. If not, uh, first time, it is exciting stuff. Um, we'll have a new drop-off area that we've been really jonesing for for a while. The new canopy and uh, over top of the entrance is actually going to come all the way out now And because I've been promising that forever, and it did come to fruition in the budget that you'll be able to pull up, drop off, and go undercover out of the rain in and out of the building. So, yeah, that's a shot of a new south entrance, um, which is the opposite side, obviously back here from where the front of the building we, uh, appears to be now. We, we built it that way on purpose, knowing that at the end of the day, most of our parking was going to be like out this way, not towards the front. So right. when it's all said and done, it'll make a lot more sense. Yeah, great outdoor yeah, space yeah. too. Let's so, go inside. Yeah, and go inside, take a look at the, the new lobby space. Um, it doesn't really do it justice to look at this picture, but it is a lot bigger lobby than we have. And all this remaining, our existing lobby remains. So yeah. it'll all tie together. Um, so this shot is looking at it from the south side doors in the lobby out here. Yep. Once it's finished, those storefront glass will come out, and you'll be walking right into the new lobby. And we have roll-up garage doors on the right and mm-hmm. the left that yep. will roll up yep. in the fall. And the, I mean, anytime it's nice out, yeah. they kind of have that indoor-outdoor yeah. concept. Right. It's going to make lobby, it feel bigger. Yeah, and the lobby will have all the other spaces we need, new bathrooms, new cafe, new spaces for people, yep. next steps area and all that. That's great. So, and in this shot, you get another picture of looking at the foyer closer, and you see the auditorium. It's going to have two entrances, and you'll come in underneath some riser seats. So we can go to the next slide showing the actual auditorium sliding in. And there's where you see the new auditorium. 1,200 seats is what we're planning on. Um, and it'll have risers in the back. Now, it won't have, like, bleacher seating. It'll have the nice seats that you're in now on the floor and up in the risers. And the entrances you can kind of see coming in 
um, like you're coming into a stadium. So um, fan-shaped, so no matter where you're going to be, we've designed it so there'll be no columns or poles in the way, so you have a good view at wherever you're at. And um, brand new sound system, because this sound system and LED wall, uh, we have plans for all of that, but new sound system, so no matter where you're at, you should be able to see really well. It won't fill really that far away once you're in the building, once you get to see it, and here's a better shot of if you're sitting in the risers looking at it. Yep. So it gives you a little bit more perspective on that. That's great. Yeah. Let's talk about kid space. Yeah. And that's a big value yeah. add. Get some yeah, good kid space has always been big to us. Every time we've built a phase, we've always added kid space. We've always added parking lots, and we're doing that again. Um, it's worth repeating that once we're done with the auditorium, this space right here, the existing auditorium will be changed over to all Discovery Point, yeah. all new kid space. Love As a matter that. of fact, the whole building that you're in now, from end to end, front to back, will all be Discovery Point. Yeah, so I, think that's I love a that. Huge I win. love that. Yeah, thirty-three thousand square feet. Yeah, that's it's, it's, a, it's always been a, a plan of ours to do that. All dedicated so, to next yeah. gen. Yeah. That's great. Good stuff. Man, I yeah. love it. Well, let's talk a little bit of timeline. Um, I know a lot of people are kind of wondering, when are we going to move in, you know? So yeah. I know this is all a little bit rough, but I yeah. think we have a, um, a timeline yeah. grid here. Walk us yeah, through it. Yeah, a rough schedule. Um, I won't go through each item. You can read them. But um, a check mark, obviously, done, getting there, pretty close. You are actually driving on a new park in some depending on what service you come to. You're parking in some of the new parking lots. Um, the foundation's um, more, more well underway. Um, real close to completion. We've started underground mechanical electrical plumbing in the, under the slab, um, and uh, it's gonna be a lot more than even what's out there now. Right now, you see the white pipes sticking up, that's your plumbing, but this kind of a building, and with the auditorium we're building, there's so much electrical uh, because of audio, video, lighting, most of it's underground, and it, it is like spaghetti junction out there before we get done. So it's gonna take us a while to get all that underground done, and of course, weather uh, affects that, but yeah. planning on, if you move your eyes to the bottom, I know everybody's probably going down, when are we gonna get into new space? Um, looking to be able to occupy the space uh, early, uh, late November, early December, so that we're in for Christmas Eve services in the new auditorium, which this won't be converted yet, but we'll at least have a new auditorium. Yeah, December 5th, 2025. Yeah. That's awesome. It seems a long way away, but that's a... It's going to come quick. It'll come quick. That's great. Yeah. Well, f one final question. You, um, you know, over, over your construction career, you've built shopping centers, movie theaters, uh, multi-million dollar homes. I know you told me backstage that this is the most significant project for you. Yeah. Um, why? It is. Why this? Yeah. Well, um... As some of you might, might or may not know, I've actually done this once before. When I got out of the construction history, I, in, the, in the video they, that was, was out here, come, came on before I came out, that we'd done this at a different church, the same kind of scenario. We met in a school, we bought land, we built, we built three, three phases, we built a 1,200-seat auditorium, same thing. And um, looking back at that, uh, it's just so bittersweet, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but now here, the same thing is... Um, all the things that I've built, they're, they're fun. I like building things. I really do. Um, but also, to be the executive pastor, it's, it's more than just building, you know, buildings and construction and putting mortar and brick and wood together. Um, in my role, I get to work with staff. I get to work with strategies and build people. Um, but everything I built before was, before the church before and then, and then now, was always um, for an end user, meaning it was a shopping center or a, a country club or a house. But here, it is an end user being the church, but the significance of it is so different to me mm -hmm. that, you know, the, everything I did before was so transactional, yeah. you know, but now it just seems more transformational because yeah. hopefully the transformation takes place in an eternal value uh, in everybody's lives yeah. as we use this tool that God gives us of a building. So that's, right. that, that's really why it just means so much to me. It's great. Yeah. That's great. Would you guys help me thank Gary for all that he does yeah. for us? And amazing. If today on your way out, I encourage you in the center of the lobby, we call it Kingdom Builder Headquarters. You can see the 3D rendering video and the 3D model. Any questions that you have about construction or finances or anything, Gary's team would love uh, to meet you. But what I love about this project is that it's not like we have like a couple families that are just flipping the bill. Um, we literally have almost 400 families since last year that have been giving over and above their regular giving. Families and individuals just like you, even teenagers who are asking the question, God, how can I bring here, make here look like heaven? So I want you to hear a story of a few of these families that have been given. Check this out. When I think about giving back, 
it's not even me thinking about me giving something, it's me returning something uh, that has already been given to me and just figuring out how can I do that in the way that is gonna be most impactful to what God has allowed me to be a part of. I think for me, ultimately, after a couple of visits, I got the sense that this was um, a welcoming and comfortable place to come and get challenged. And the messages continue to have me reflecting and uh, challenging myself to, to, to grow in, in my faith, so. The first moment that I set foot in the church and heard the music, my, for me, my eyes started to swell up with tears because I knew we were in the right spot. But again, it was this message of how do we use the Bible to guide what we're doing every single day while we're just lifing. And so I loved that and we loved that. It was all just so applicable for where we were at in our life and it remains to be relevant every single sermon we go to. So yeah, a lot of things kind of drew us here and have kept us here. We were drawn to make LifePoint our home when we moved here from Charleston, South Carolina three years ago. We always knew we wanted to be in children's ministry. That is something right. we love. So we took the tour of Discovery Point. We immediately joined the theater team. That was when we saw that, uh, that way to serve. Yeah. So we see firsthand, right, Every the Sunday. growth, the amount of children that are pouring into Discovery Point. So when we heard about Kingdom Builders, we knew immediately the need if only for the children for Discovery Point, Absolutely. which is not just that, but. Absolutely, I think Kingdom Builders is not only gonna give us a larger worship space, but to be able to take the space that we're utilizing for worship right now and dedicate that to children's ministries yes. is just so awesome. It's gonna really um, serve the youth in so many great ways. And we know that, that that's one of the key uh, cornerstones of LifePoint Church is, is youth ministries. and. Uh, we just appreciate that so much and again one of the reasons we really fell in love with the church and one of the reasons that we are so firmly behind kingdom builders and the campaign for phase three hi i'm addie vining i'm 17 years old i'm a senior at catawba Ridge high school and my family has been coming to life point for about six years now so in january of this past year i started business with my mom an online jewelry business um, the steps we took in which to create the business was creating an LLC and creating a website and creating um, all my marketing pieces. In the midst of that, I knew I had to have a mission, but I wasn't sure what it was going to be. And I remember coming to church one day and I heard about Kingdom Builders Phase 3. I was like, I have no idea how I'm going to create an impact on this. I'm not sure what I'm going to do. I knew my parents would give in some way, but I just didn't know what I was being called to do. And when I finally started creating my steps and thought about my mission, I came back to the idea of Kingdom Builders and I was like, you know, I want to support a cause. I want my business to support a nonprofit and I thought it would be an amazing idea to give to the church. Yeah, I recall last November when we had Commitment Sunday, how impressed I was with the participation of all the owners here at LifePoint. Everybody going forward with their commitment card, and I just felt a real sense of, of community throughout the church that Sunday. It was so great. Yeah. And I think I would add, we'd been at LifePoint two years by that point, yes. so we, and we already felt at home. Mm -hmm. But there was something about Commitment Sunday that just deepened our just family feeling into LifePoint yeah. that was really special that day. Our first thought was, we're doing this. Now we just need to think about how much and how much can we give and what are we gonna what are we gonna do and how are we gonna align on this? And so for us there was no hesitation about if we were gonna contribute. It was more of, okay, what can we do? How much can we give? Our kids teach us so much about how to be good Christians and to walk in faith and to be more like who God needs us to be. So just seeing how we're going to have a bigger uh, space for them and more different things that we can bring to them connecting with their spiritual faith um, is something that I'm really excited to see in this next chapter for LifePoint. A piece of advice I would give coming from a 17 year old who's decided to give money would be do what your heart is telling you and if, it, if you're being called to give then that's Jesus telling you be generous. You just see that when you're willing to give in every sense of the word to others, you do in some godly way, you grow and you just become 
a more connected person and a more fulfilled person because of those things that you've been able to give to others. The thing that excites me most about the future of our church is knowing that I get to call this place home. And I'm excited to see the end results because I know that I've made an impact by giving and, I, and I'm excited to see how my impact is going to look. I hope that through this expansion of Kingdom Builders that God really shines light on my generation and pushes us to seek Him and find Him. From the home that I have, the healthy children that I have, the wife that I'm blessed to have, the community, this church, all those things are things that I attribute to, to God's generosity and it's something that, you know, I try to emulate as much as possible, knowing that it would be impossible to do. And any way that I can do that, I try to, to, to just uh, pull that through, so. And I look at generosity as really beyond just financial. I think generosity yeah. comes in time, talents, and treasures. And it is just right that we honor God by giving back to Him of our time, of our talents, and of our treasures. And I think Kingdom Builders gives us a great opportunity to do all three of those. Man, help me thank them for sharing their story. Isn't that great? I love it. You know, there is, there's, there's a lot about the future of the church that, that I don't know. There's a lot about church ministry. I'm still learning. But there are two things I am so certain about. The first is that the activated church of Jesus Christ is still the hope of the world. Amen? That as this world gets darker, the church of Jesus Christ never has had a more better opportunity to be that light than right now. And the second thing that I know to be true is that God in his providential wisdom has determined that he's going to accomplish his mission through broken, flawed, redeemed people like you and I. It's just a matter of will you say, will you say yes? Uh, so let me give you a little bit of the financial update, and then we'll close in prayer today. If you're kind of wondering where are we at financially, how we're doing, last November, roughly $6.1 million was committed last year, and I have the great honor to tell you that you, LifePoint, are outperforming the pace, which is you. This is LifePoint. I'm not surprised. Check this out right here. We have already given $3 million, which is 53.7% of the overall $6 million goal. That's each and every single one of us just doing our part. So let me just tell you, thank you so much. I do not, that's over and above giving, guys. That's incredible. So the total cost of the project, in case you're wondering, is right at 11.8 million. Uh, this is about 800,000 more than we projected last November when we launched the campaign. Uh, you can only imagine with inflation and just the cost of, of uh, construction uh, projects and, and materials, that's how it's gone up. So Gary has this daunting tasks to hold the line. Um, he also has contingencies built into that number that we hopefully won't have to use. So here's a few goals that we have coming up on December the 8th, which is our end of year offering, and I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, we have a couple goals. Uh, the first one is we'd love to raise an additional $500,000 in new commitments over the next 12 months. So, so not all up front, just over the next 12 months. That's why uh, today when you came in, you'll notice on your seat, we have some literature for you. One is a trifold brochure. This is for you to take home to read up later. But also the, the, the other one is this commitment card. If you wanna grab that real quick, you can just grab that out. Um, I just wanna get this in your hands early. Uh, we have six weeks or so leading up to December the 8th. So there's, there's no pressure with this. Um, I'm going to be your spiritual tour guide, and I'm just going to help you take steps to get to uh, December the 8th as we come together for our end of year offering. So there's, there's two types of people that might want to be a part of this, right? The first one is what I call new commitment family. This might be those of you that have been new to the church in the last year, and you're like, goodness, I want to hold my link in the chain. We want to do something over that final year of Kingdom Builders. Um, and you could begin to fill this out. Or maybe you were here a year ago and you're like, I didn't, get, I didn't make a commitment last year. I didn't think this thing was going to work. But it's working. And I want to jump on the ship that's floating right now. So let us get behind this. That's great. I don't know who you are. You know who you are. Um, but maybe you want to be a part of that. There are three ways that you can come up with your overall total for 12 months. So the courageous gift, that would be what you plan to bring on December the 8th. 
Then you have consistent giving. That'd just be you and your family or individually thinking about what could I give over and above for the next year. And then this creative gift, like this is, this is re- what really has the ability to take your gift to that next level. Like what creatively could you do? So I was in your seat a year ago. My wife and I, we had nothing for the creative portion until a friend of ours gave us this idea to hike Mount Everest. Now, we didn't literally hike Mount Everest, but we did this event last weekend where we hiked the equivalent of 29,029 feet, and we did this for a fundraiser for our creative portion for Kingdom Builders, and we finished, guys. We actually made it. Pretty amazing, like, awesome experience. I just got my legs back yesterday, so if I'm hobbling, you know why. So our goal was, man, we thought a year ago, sitting in the seat just like you, if we could raise $15,000 for our creative gift, and that's just the creative box of our overall total, we thought that'd be a win. But but God had a bigger plan. We raised $26,000 throughout that process, 100% went to Kingdom Builder. So I only tell you that because I think if you got creative, you might surprise yourself. It might be something you could sell or some land or maybe you want to exchange um, some, some retirement or stock, which we're set up to be able to receive all of that. Or maybe you want to out hike us and do your own hike and, I don't know, go rim to rim at the Grand Canyon and show us up and raise 30000 Whatever. Um, it's a cool way. Then what you'll do is you'll add all three of these up and that'll be your overall total. Now, the backside. Maybe you made a commitment last November and since then, God's, he's just blessed you. And you say, okay, Lord, um, I want to add on to what we originally committed. You'll fill that out. And then on December the 8th, it is our end of year offering. Uh, we do this every single year. We've been doing this for over 15 years at LifePoint. It's the one time a year where I just ask everybody who attends to prayerfully consider giving a one-time gift. Um, you know us. You know we don't care about money. You know we teach biblical stewardship. That's it. No fear, no guilt. We don't, we don't mess with any of that. But this is the one time a year where I will just boldly ask, every single individual who attends to prayerfully consider giving a one-time gift towards Kingdom Builders. And we're going to come together on the 8th, and some of you are going to give a 12-month commitment, and some of you are just going to give a gift, and we're going to watch God do incredible things because our why matters. That's why if you haven't stopped by the Kingdom Builder mural, I encourage you, stop by this today. Like Rich had said earlier, these photos that reflect the baptisms, yes, we've had 109 since this calendar year, but since we launched Kingdom Builders last September, we've seen 250 people get baptized in just over a year, which is unbelievable. Now, I I know we say numbers like that, but I wanna zoom in on a photo. It's like right here. You can't see it from there, so let's zoom in. This is a story of Lydia. Lydia is 17 years old. She writes this. I was born in Istanbul, Turkey, into a Muslim family. My life was not good at the time, and I went into a deep depression around the age of 11. My dad, being American, he wanted to move us to Fort Mill after seeing how the economy had been affected in Turkey. I was 12. I moved to this new area, didn't know anybody. It took me a few years to learn the language and the culture of the people around me and to adjust to a new life with a clean slate. About a year ago, I decided to take an interest in Christianity after my aunt took me to church that she worked at. That day changed my whole life. As soon as I walked into the church, I felt relief, as if I belonged for the first time. It wasn't too long after that that I gave my life to Christ, my Lord and my Savior. My aunt bought me my first Bible and I started reading it every night. I felt so much better about myself and I quickly had a better outlook in life. I was cured of my depression. I could focus on school better. I dropped my bad habits. I started dressing more modestly. Jesus saw me struggling and helped me in the best way I ever could have imagined. And I am excited to be baptized to tell the world that I'm unashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. My old ways are gone. My new life is here. And we baptized Lydia last Sunday at our baptisms. Isn't that amazing? And I know Lydia's in this service, and thank you so much for allowing me to share your story. And that's our why. At the end of my life, I would rather have better stories than better stuff. So the chain is in our hands. So as a way to be praying over the next uh, six weeks on your way out, we're going to give you what kind of resembles a a link of a chain. This is a wristband, and it just simply has that slogan, uh, here as in heaven. 
And there's a couple different colors. I would love for every single one of you on your way out, you'll notice right when you walk out the doors, there's a table. Will you grab one of these and just, just wear this here as in heaven and just let it be a reminder to pray. Pray for the project. Pray for, for your generosity on December the 8th. Pray that we are good news people in a bad news world, that God would see heaven touch this earth. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together, can we? I invite you to stand up. Let's stand our feet. Lord, we love you. We thank you. God, we thank you that the history of the church is now in our hands. And Lord, we take that with the responsibility that it deserves. And God, I thank you for stories like Lydia and literally hundreds of others. And if we had time, we could pass the mic around about how you've transformed all of our lives. We're saved by grace through faith. I was lost, but I'm, I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. I was this, but now I'm that. God, thank you for this. God, that's why we're doing what we're doing. Lord, I pray as we pray. Over the next eight weeks, six weeks leading up to December the 8th, what it is that you want us to give, God, let it just be clear. Let us give without guilt or compulsion, uh, but with uh, sincerity and joy and gratitude in our hearts because we know that when we pray for heaven to touch earth, oh boy, it's going to touch. <laughs> and we better get ready to watch you move. We love you. It's in your name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, church. Have a great day. See you next week.